Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so we were doing this slide set on observables. So let me just recap uh, what we were doing in the last lecture. Um, so the objective of this slide set is to explain to you how we calculate observables in quantum mechanics. So an observable is of course, something that you want to find out about the system, so it's something that um, quantifies the system, so it might be things like position and energy, things like this. Um, yeah. and, uh, and we've also learned that in quantum mechanics you make measurements by probabilities, and because an observable is something that you read out from the system, you really have to do it through uh, measurements. So how do we turn a um, quantum mechanical measurement into an observable? Well, uh, we started off with this example of, uh, say, measuring the position of a particle, and let's say that it's in one of these boxes here. Uh, each one of these boxes is a definite state, and when we measure, we're going to find that it's in one of these boxes. So quantum mechanically, we can write a superposition like this with some coefficients, uh, which are complex numbers. And uh, when you do the measurement, what you're going to find, as we've discussed in previous chapters, is that the probability will be related to like this coefficient squared or modulus squared. And uh, you, you're going to get some probability distribution if you do this a lot of times. And from that, we can calculate things like averages. And um, that's just, this part of it is just what we know, know from normal probability theory. You just, if you've got a probability distribution, you can always calculate things like averages. And so when we talk about actually an observable, in quantum mechanics, it's always actually some average uh, value over a probability distribution. So when you do a measurement, it's always going to be there's some randomness. And then when you say, okay, I want to know the, you know, uh, value of, say, what's, what's the energy of the particle, uh, quantum mechanically it always turns out to be uh, involving taking an average over this probability. So in this case, the, we'll be talking about an average position of the, of the particle. Might be somewhere around here. And obviously it doesn't have to be in one of these boxes anymore because we're just talking about an average. An average could be equally somewhere sort of between, so it might be like 4.3. Um, we can calculate variances as well, and that is a measure of you know, obviously how sort of broad the distribution is, or in the case of position, it's sort of, you might interpret it as like, kind of like the error in the in the position. So, you know, you say, okay, I know the average is 4.3, but, you know, on every measurement that you do, it's going to be 4.3 plus or minus something. And then basically the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, will give you that plus or minus. So, um, so that's basically how you do it, but there's a very neat mathematical formulation of how you calculate it uh, once you've been given like the probability, sorry, the, uh, the wave function and, uh, and, and basically the way that we think of this is that the wave function is something that contains basically the information about the physical system and the observable is something different to that. The observable is something where you taking that wave function and then you're trying to, you know, find some information about it. So the observable um, and the wave function are sort of different entities, if you like. And the observable has a, a set of sort of states where it's like definite values of something. So in the position example, it's like, you know, if it's in this box, it's in definitely position in position three meters or four meters, like that. And then it's also got the, the, the kind of the state where you've got these definite values 
but it's also got uh, the numerical value associated with that, right? And this is where like it becomes like a physical quantity because this thing Q here will have some dimensions, right? So it's not like a just a number. Um, if we're doing energy, then, you know, it might be three joules or four joules, you know, things like this. An actual numerical value of the energy, or if it, it's a distance, then it'll be like three meters, four meters. Uh, so the units of this thing depend upon the thing that you're measuring. But this thing is a state, right? So that's just the regular quantum state. So we've, we've sort of got this pair of things, the state, and then the value that's associated with um, And so with the observable and then the wave function, we can kind of combine these things uh, and just as we said before, we can calculate things like averages by just do, doing probability times this value here. And then, because we know from before that the probability is actually the modulus squared of these coefficients, we can rewrite it like this. So, uh, you know, that's sort of leading up to this kind of uh, notation where um, uh, we can actually even sort of um, just streamline our procedure in calculating averages. And the way that we can do that is by uh, constructing this observable operator. And then so basically what we do here is the value that we've talked about, like the three joules, four joules, that thing, uh, we, we put that there. And then we calculate the outer product of the state that that observable is associated with. And because it's the outer product, this is going to be a matrix of some sort or an operator. And then what we can do is we can streamline this whole process of getting the average by saying, or, or defining, I suppose, that we're going to say that the average of this quantity is going to be like we get this operator that we just constructed, we get like the wave function, we sandwich it between the bra and the ket. And then um, what I showed you last time is that actually doing this thing is the same as basically calculating this thing from kind of like what we uh, what we started off with, just from that probabilistic picture. So just calculating this quantity, doing the sandwich of the wave function, um, you don't have to bother, you don't even have to think about the probabilities anymore. You just sort of go and calculate this thing and then just does all that probabilistic averaging stuff. So you don't have to sort of even think so much about, you know, what you're really doing. Uh, and what you're really doing is that you're doing lots of measurements. You know, this is what the experimentalist guys would have to do. You know, they're getting the, they're preparing the wave function and they're doing the measurement and they repeat the experiment a thousand times. And then they've got like these probabilities and then they've got statistics and then, you know, they average over something and then here's my average value of the energy. Um, you know, if you're a theoretical physicist, then you just about you can just forget about that and you go, uh huh, okay, average, yeah, I know how to do that. I just sandwich the wave function with this operator and then that just does the job. So, um, yeah, so I showed you why that is. Basically, you just sort of put these into the definition and then you'll work out that basically you'll get a quantity like this at some point. Um, yeah, so I think this is where we got up to last lecture. So, everyone's fine with this? Okay. All right, so, um, so what we're going to continue on today with is a uh, slightly more complicated observable, okay? So, uh, actually, this example was pretty simple as far as examples go because um, the, the, the simplification was that actually this n, see this, these n's here, that's actually the observable things, right? And the way that we wrote the wave function, well, here's the wave function. Uh, this n, they were in the same basis, okay? So 
when we did this computation here, actually it was pretty easy because basically because this and this were the same basis, uh, we could just use the orthogonality properties and then you know, these sums would disappear. Well, okay, one sum disappears here, you get that. And then in a couple of lines you get the thing that you want. Um, but actually, in general, that's not always true. Um, like, uh, you can have a situation where uh, you can have maybe another observable, let's call it R, and maybe the basis that the observable is written is uh, not the same basis as your wave function. Of course, you can write your wave function in, in, the, in, the, in the other basis, right? We did that a couple of lectures ago, uh, where we rewrite the wave function in another basis, right? So a basis is just you know just a basis choice, and um, uh, you, you should be able to write the same wave function in a different basis, right? So uh, so of course we can we can do that, but um, you know in terms of this calculation that we just did here, you might uh, appreciate already that. Well, if this n and this n are kind of not on the same basis, then we can't just use that uh, Kronecker product, uh, sorry, Kronecker delta, and um, can't just do the, you know, this sum doesn't just collapse to this one. So it's a little bit more complicated, you know, in terms of the calculation. Um, but, uh, but basically the, um, well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Terms of the explanation, but but basically the, the final message is that actually the way that we calculate the average even for an operator with a different basis, so even if this m is not the same basis as the wave function, it doesn't matter. It's uh, it all takes care of itself, uh, and in fact it's just still the same formula. So we don't really have to worry really about the fact that it's r is in a different basis. Uh, we can just still go ahead and then do that, um, uh, or use this formula for the average, and still it's going to be, you know, uh, you have the, this op R operator thing that you constructed and sandwich it with the wave functions, and then you still get the average. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to show you now is like, you know, why, why that is. So, um, so firstly, uh, firstly, um, so basically we're going to do it sort of two methods, if you like, okay? Um, so, okay, so basically what we, what we eventually want to show is that, um, Um, well, we want, to, we want to sort of justify that the average of R is going to be, going to be this thing, okay? And so, um, so let's, let's, let's uh, take kind of two different ways of doing this. Um, and this uh, first approach is somewhat more like following the definition of, of what the average average is going to be. And um, so what we've got here is basically we've got a observable um, R, which eventually R. So basically, we've got our observable R. It's got uh, these are the values of the measurement, and then this M here is the um, basically the measurement basis. That's the basis that we're going. Form our measurement in, and remember, you know, in the, maybe the slide set before this one, we did measurements in different bases, right? So we didn't, you know, when you do a measurement, 
So, like for a qubit, we, you could just do zero, one basis measurements, but actually you can do all kinds of different measurements, measurement bases too, so this might be like plus or something for a qubit. Right? Um, so, uh, so we've got values in the measurement and then the measurement basis. So, um, somewhat the, the definition of what the average is going to be. So, let's say our initial wave function that we're going to going to write it in is going to be, uh, say, in a, like this. So that's our initial uh, kind of way that we're going to write it. And um, so, uh, okay, uh, let's see. Okay, so. Somehow, maybe my explanation is turning to not, not exactly following the same order as the slides, but uh, some, uh, I think what I'm going to talk about is basically on this slide, actually. So, um, this is uh, our original state. And this is a different basis. Uh, to n. Okay. So just just to give you a bit of an example here, so suppose you know with, it's like you're given a wave function like this. Yeah, that's our given wave function. We know what a0 and a1 are. But actually our measurement operator is 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 more like this. Um, so that our measurement, measurement is, suppose it's like, um, you know, if it's plus, then the value of R is, um, okay, well, I'm just making up an example here, but something like this, right? So basically, when you do the measurement, you're going to measure in the plus or minus spaces, and remember, plus means, uh, Plus means this basis like this, and minus is like this. Right? So, so you know this basis is not the same as the basis that this is written in, right? This is zero one basis. It's plus or minus. And okay, so there's some values here, and um, you know these states are not orthogonal like to this one, right? So, for example, zero and plus, uh, you know, this is not orthogonal. Zero minus is uh, yeah, one over root two plus, plus or minus. So, you know, these are not orthogonal states. And so, um, yeah, so so the, the kind of logic that we did there before doesn't quite follow. Okay, so, um, so how to, how to rewrite psi in the m basis. So there's a very um, commonly used uh, trick to do this. And the way that you do it is by using the uh, definition of the identity operator. And so the identity operator is special because um, uh, you can take any basis and basically the, the form of the identity operator always looks the same. So what I mean by that is that, for example, here's the identity operator in the, the n basis, so maybe in this example it's like 0 and 1. Um, but actually the identity operator is always the same in in another basis, so this here's the m basis, and here that might be like this plus or minus. Right? Um, and so again, just to give you an example, so the identity operator, so what this one is saying is basically this, 0, 0, 1, 1. So in the matrix language, this is like, well, well it's obviously this, right? So clearly identity. 
Um, but what, with, what this is saying here, that actually this is also equal to plus out of product and minus out of product. And that's a little bit less easy to see, but um, if you use the fact that this out of product is like um, 1 over root 2 of um, 1, all the way around. One 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 plus one over two of one minus one. Sorry, I keep on doing it from all the way around. One minus one one minus one. So this is going to be a half of one 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 one. This is a half of one minus one minus one one like this. Off diagonal terms disappear, and it's half plus half, right? So it kind of looks almost like magic. Uh, you know, you're working on a totally different basis, but actually, eventually, the the identity thing is exactly the same. So uh, this always works as long as uh, well, you've got some orthogonal basis, I guess. Um, Maybe it's even more general than that. Okay. Um, de definitely true if you've got orthogonal base. And so we can use this property to, um, to rewrite this state, which is in this n basis, in another basis. Okay. So basically, the I've written it here, but let's rewrite it. So, okay. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this state here by the identity. Okay, so identity times any state is the same state, so of course I'm allowed to do that. Um, but the trick is, is that I'm, instead of using this... Uh, n basis here that it's already in, I'm going to use the m basis for the identity. So here's the identity operator in the m basis. Okay. And here's the original state. Okay, and then just uh, um, pull the sums to the front. I'm going to interchange the. I oh know, sorry, no, no. Um, so this is the. Um, this is the inner product here. And this is a number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to. M, N. And this is the leftover vector. So by by doing this, I've um, I've uh, basically got the vector in terms of the m, right? And if I just define this as uh, b b m. Uh, basically, this thing here is my um, coefficients in this in this new basis. Um, can I do example. Okay, small example. A small example again. Um, So just to follow the same logic. So uh, previously, when we rewrote the spaces, what we did was something like, you know, say we wrote want to write zero, one in plus or minus spaces. We got some relation to rewrite zero in terms of zero plus state and minus state substituted. So this is a slightly different technique, I guess, but uh, we, we're going to get the same answer. So um, what we're actually doing here, 
for example, in this example, is we are going to see this plus and minus thing here. This is the identity, right? So we're basically going to use this um, out here as the identity. And then here's our state. It's uh, A0 plus A1 like this. Then just multiply everything out. So then um, this one times this one. So if you remember uh, these overlaps, well, I've already got it here. I think. So it's, well, it's actually the complex conjugate of this, but it's the same. So um, this one, this one, and this one will give a zero over root two. This one and this one will give a one over root two. Okay. Then let's multiply this one and this one out. So this one and this one, a zero, um, will give a zero over root two. And then this one and this one um, gives minus. So, uh, you know, this will look, I hope, familiar from what we did before a few lectures ago when we did a slightly different way when we just substituted, like, these basis states um, in terms of the, these states. So, uh, eventually all these methods work the same. Okay, so, um, all right, so we've... We've re re rewritten this state in terms of the m basis, okay? Then now that we've done that, um, it's actually uh, fairly straightforward to calculate so what is the average, okay? So the average average value of r, so just it's kind of definition actually. So it's going to be like the probability that in the yeah, I should write in. Uh, these are the probabilities probabilities uh, in the M basis times by the values, right? So you when you calculate the average, it's the probabilities times the values of the R. So you know, here are the values. So what are these probabilities? Well, uh, now that we've rewritten this thing in terms of this M basis, we can just do the sort of the definition kind of, yeah, it's just BM, BM mod squared RM. And if you like, we can, now we've got a formula for it, right? We've got this thing here. So if you like, we can also write it like this, uh, inside the absolute value, we've got a n m over like n squared. Okay. Okay, so this is gonna be our first approach of uh, how to get uh, the average. Um, so this is the thing that we uh, should get eventually. Um, in a way, we know that this should be correct, right? So now what I want to show you is that actually you can do it like that, but you can equally do it just by calculating this thing. So it's not entirely, well, not obvious to me, that that whole procedure that we just did there is going to just eventually just give the same, same value as just, just throwing it into this definition. But let me show you that it actually does. So... about something not all. Okay. 
Uh, well, okay, so this was uh, approach one, if you like, okay. Now let's do approach two. And basically the approach in this case is just simply uh, just evaluate just evaluate that. Okay. And just don't don't worry about probabilities or anything, just evaluate the formula. Approach. All right, so let's just throw it into the formula and hopefully work very well. Okay, so let's just uh, evaluate this thing. Okay, well, well, we've got psi, we've got r, so let's just, um, just go for it. Um, so. First, you know, because this thing is basically like um, row vector matrix row vector, right? Basically, that's what's happening in here. Um, this is this is this ket here. This is the bra. This is the operator part, right? So uh, we can do this in any order. You know, you could do like this times this first, or this times this first. Let me just do this this uh, this part here first. So let's calculate rho times psi. Okay, well, um, so this is our definition of R. And, okay, that's R. And that's our psi. So, here. So this is going to be double sum n, and so we're going to have an inner product between this n, this n. Also got these coefficients rm, a n. And then finally, the vector that we're going to end up with is this one. Okay. So that's r times Psi. Okay. Now let's multiply this thing with the row vector here. Okay. So we've got to calculate the row vector of this. So we take complex conjugates here. And because we've already we've got an n here, let's use a different label of uh, prime. All right, did over there too. So a n prime star ket vector. Yes. Then bring all this stuff that we have already calculated in the previous step here. Okay. Right. Um, now. Right. Okay. Uh, I forgot to kind of mention here that. Uh, remember, we can't do anything like, we can't say that this is like a Kronecker uh, delta or anything like that because this is m and this is n, right? So these are different non-orthogonal vectors and so we, we can't just make that a delta, um, yeah, Kronecker delta. So that's the simplest that we can write this. Um, so like that, again, uh, this is in the n basis and this is in the m basis. Again, they're not orthogonal, so we can't really do anything simpler than just simply combine this into an inner product. So now we've got here a triple sum n, n prime. We've got r, m, a, n, a, n prime star. And then we've got a m overlap with n. And then we've got a n prime overlap with n. Okay. Okay. So um, what I'm trying to show here is that this thing is actually the same as that. So it looks the same.
Okay, not hundred percent obvious yet. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. So we need to use sort of a relation that says that actually. Um, so if you've got anything like, well, well yeah. uh, M N is actually going to be. Um, the, uh, if you reverse these things, or yeah, kind of, uh, yeah. so if you take the the track, like complex conjugate of this thing is going to be equal to to this, and um, uh, yeah, okay. So we're going to use this relation, and the other thing is that we've got to be a little bit careful with the um, kind of labels here. So, so uh, when you have a sum like this, basically you have to make sure that you know you don't pull anything out of the sum that depends upon the variable that you're summing over here. Right? So let's separate this sum and maybe try and start to make it look a little bit like that. So we've got n, and we've got an a n. So we're going to do this n summation here. And because so far nothing depends on n prime, so that's why we can write this n prime here. N prime star. And this one is n prime like this. Oh, sorry. And then I forgot. So actually, we can put like brackets around here because like this, because uh, th these are the only things that depend on n here. And these are the only things that depend upon n prime here. Okay. And we've got Rm finally. Okay. Um, no. Yes, exactly, yes. So, so actually this thing here is just actually a complex conjugate of all that stuff there, because this is, uh, we've got uh, An star, and we've got Using this relation, when you change the order of the uh, kind of the not the order, but if you take the yeah transpose of this whole thing uh, or complex conjugate, then you um, the same as taking the uh, complex conjugate. So basically, this thing is yeah this a n m n. So we need a different label on this, otherwise we get our labels mixed up. And that's exactly equal to that's exactly equal to the expression that we had uh, over here. So um, basically, what all this was trying to prove to you was that um, uh, you can use this formula. <laughs> um, that's basically what all this was trying to convince you. So, um, using this formula, uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter that it's in a different basis, that R and the wave function are in a different basis. You know, just throw it in there. Don't worry about it, calculate it, and you know, this will give the correct average. Um, this was uh, sort of the you know, way that we did it from a definition, you know, through probabilities, so forth. And this was just like, just throw it into this formula and they're, they're the same. last lecture, but this is why we have the bracket notation, because this, uh, it sort of implies this formula already in the notation. So we just sandwich the observable by the states, and then that's 
how we calculate averages. Um, so, of course, we can calculate other uh, probabilistic variables like variance. Um, so, variance again would simply be written as this. Variance is, of course, the square of the uh, observable minus the observable average squared. So, in this case, essentially you take the square of the um, operator and then uh, calculate the expectation value and then you minus by the square of the just regular average. Okay, so yeah, so that basically finishes up that um, kind of general formalism for the uh, averages. So we can go back a little bit more down to earth to um, again some simple things. Um, and so this is more or less an example, but it's a very important example between in the context of quantum computing, because this is again looking at um, qubit, qubit, uh, the qubit case. So uh, we can, uh, uh, of course, construct some observables for qubits too, right? So actually, one example here was sort of coming close to that. Um, now, because a qubit only has you know a very small number of um, parameters to describe it. Uh, in a way, the, the, the number of observables that you can make for a qubit are also not, not so big. And um, it turns out that uh, there are um, three kind of important observables that you can have for a qubit. Um, and these are what we have already sort of been playing with and have, haven't really discussed it like this, but you should already, uh, this should already look a little bit familiar. But these are the so-called Pauli operators, um, named after Wolfgang Pauli, one of the you know, early founders of uh, quantum mechanics. And, um, and basically what these are, so there's the names of these operators are, they're called like x, y, and z. I don't know why I wrote it in this order, but x, y, and z. And essentially what you, you have is uh, x, y, and z are all uh, essentially similar types of observables because actually you know, the value of the, uh, each outcome here, they're always plus and minus one. The only thing that is different is the actual basis. Right? So remember, each um, observable always has the value and then the, the basis. Right? So you get this output, you get this uh, you know, measurement result, it's in some particular state, and you associate that with a value. So the, the values are always just plus or minus one. Okay? And so the only thing that's different between the x, y, and z observables are just these states. Okay? So the states so could be in different, different bases. And the states, so the z Pauli operator has the basis states of just zero and one. Okay? So this is sort of, was our sort of simplest example that we started off. Um, the so-called x Pauli operator has the basis states of the plus and minus states. So this is again what we already playing here with. And there's another one uh, called the y uh, Pauli operator, and this has basis states uh, that look like this: zero plus i one and i zero plus one. Okay. Um, well, that's just sort of a definition. Um, so, you now, why, why would we want to define it like that? You know, is there a kind of an intuition with the, maybe the um, definition looks a little bit arbitrary? Well, um, firstly, uh, so, uh, 
For example, let's let's uh, take the poly uh, the, the poly Z operator. So again, basically physically, what this corresponds to is actually you are uh, you've got some state, and you're going to make a measurement in the zero or one basis like this. Yeah. And then um, obviously you're going to get probabilities of mod alpha and mod beta squared. So um, uh, this, uh, if you take the um, average value of this, basically uh, of, of this observable, when you, when you take the observable, you know, each one of these, you assign a value to it, right? So you basically what the Pauli Z operator is saying is you assign a value of one to this outcome and a value of uh, minus one to the other one. So basically, when you calculate the average of this, what we, you will get is alpha mod squared minus beta mod squared. So uh, you know, we can do it like, um, say, just the approach one or approach two. So in approach one, basically, you know, here's our probabilities. Um, close. Here's our probabilities. Um, and so for that case, we're going to assign a value of 1. For this case, we're going to assign a value of minus 1. So, um, so histogram-wise, it's sort of like... You know, basically what's happening is that you know, here's, um, here's our state at zero, here's our state one, here's our probabilities. This one is like alpha squared, this one is beta squared. And then the value that we assign, just sort of arbitrary, but let's assign the value one to this one. Assign the value minus one to this one. Um, and so, uh, the average of this is, so, you know, say it's all in one, then, of course, the value of this thing, the average value of z, <coughs> will be minus one. Right? If it's all in zero, then the value of this one, you know, the average value will be one. So this is a value, it's a quantity that goes between plus and minus one. So it's this because it's um, you know, like uh, you could say like um, the value of this one is one, and then the value of this one is minus one. So value probability, value probability. Um, alternatively. <coughs> If you do it like method two or approach two that we just did there, um, essentially what we're calculating here is um, um, this kind of thing. So um, the uh, oh, I didn't really introduce the matrix. Um, for this one, it's uh, reasonably easy to see that this should be the matrix because um, the operator is uh, defined like here. So it's like the value multiplied by the, this is the outcome. So it's 1 times by 0 out of product 0 minus plus plus. Uh, Minus one, one, one. So it's basically just zero, zero, minus one, one. And that's that's equal to this matrix. Okay. Uh, we can do this matrix multiplication. So this is sort of like method two, right? We can do this matrix multiplication. Um, it's going to be alpha minus beta. Again, it's going to be alpha squared minus beta squared. So, the same thing. Okay. 
Um, so, um, essentially what this is, is it's a kind of a, it's a measure of, you know, uh, are we getting more zeros or are we getting more ones? You know, basically, and the, the, you know, whether it's like more on the minus one side or on the plus one side is a measure of basically how sort of biased you are in terms of, uh, you know, like which of the coefficients are going to be larger. So, you know, if alpha and beta are the same magnitude, then this average value of zero at Z is um, zero because uh, you know, they, they kind of cancel out. Um, so, uh, yeah. so basically this thing is a, is a kind of a, it's always a kind of a measure of, you know, so which, which one is larger, which, which coefficient uh, in this particular basis is the coefficient is larger. Um, now, if you look in a, in a different base, like for the all, uh, different Pauli operators, so if you look at the x operator, like plus minus or y, these, these guys, then basically, again, it's still like, you know, how, you know, how much is it in this, uh, what is the coefficient of this term, or what is the coefficient of this? You know, which one is bigger? If it's zero, then basically it's like equal. If it's one, then basically it's this or this one, the weighting is larger. If it's minus, then the weighting of this one is larger. But basically it's always, uh, the average value is always telling you that, you know, which way is it sort of um, uh, weighted in, in terms of these bases. <coughs> okay, so um, yeah, so we can write the uh, these things in terms of matrices as well. So I already did this one. So you know, just basically following the general expression for the. Observable operator, you have a value, and it's always plus or minus one in this thing. And then here's the basis states. And for zero and one, it's just zero and one. But uh, for Pauli x operator, Pauli y operator, it's uh, these plus minus states or the plus y minus y states. <coughs> so. So let's maybe just do one. So, so there's Pauli X. Um, so again, the, sort of the general definition is like this. Okay, so in this case, there's only two basis states, right? So first one, so the value is one, and then the basis states are plus, and then the second one, the value is minus one. And then the um, states uh, are minus. Okay, and then we've got definitions of the states here. Uh, we can write this in matrix notation because this one is uh, like this one one row vector. This one is one one column vector. Um, one minus one, oops, let's get this wrong, one minus one row vector, one minus one column vector, then this will be one, 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 
this one will be 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. So remember this calculation actually looks a lot like, remember when I was writing the um, matrix form of the identity operator, actually the only thing that's different here is this minus sign. Right? So if this uh, was a plus, these off-diagonal terms would cancel with zero, and then you just get uh, identity operator. But here, because of this minus sign, you actually get um, the other terms. So actually the diagonals cancel, and the off-diagonals are the ones that remain. <coughs> Um, now for y, it's kind of similar, there's a bunch of i's around the place. Uh, so you've got to be a bit more careful with the complex conjugation here, so when you do this here, you know, you're going to have a minus i over here and so forth, but uh, similar calculation. <coughs> okay, so why don't we do a bit of practice? Um, so, using the method of your choice, so you could either use the matrix notation or the um, you know, bracket notation. Um, it would be easier, actually. I think in this case, <coughs> I think in this case, I would recommend the matrix notation. It's actually a little bit probably quicker. So, um, try and calculate the expectation values of x, y, z operators. So let me just rewrite it here. So x is that, y is this, and z is that. And um, uh, calculate, well, three of you, so why don't we do... Uh, <laughs> Um, X, Y, Z. You can do Z, do Y, and do X. <laughs> Divide the task three times quicker.
to simplify the uh, oh. feature expression. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, then I mean when you do the mod squared, this phase will disappear. Yeah. Oh, right. what? Like because when you I can I can use this one. Yes you can, yes. But beta is beta beta star, right? And then when you the so beta is this and then beta star is the minus i prime. Mm -hmm. And then this one actually Yes, but maybe double angle formula. guys got were x was sine what is it what was x again sine theta cos phi right yes uh yeah sine theta cos uh this one was sine theta sine phi right yeah and z was just cosine theta okay um now, we did talk about this before, but does this remind you of anything? <coughs> right, spherical coordinates, yes. So, <coughs> so, yeah, got calculations, but you guys did it fine. Yeah, so, these formulas are exactly the formulas for um, if you've got a unit sphere and you write the coordinates on the unit sphere in terms of the, I forget what names of these angles are called, um, but you know, theta and phi in spherical coordinates. Um, so theta is the angle uh, where you rotate around um, the y-axis initially. Um, okay, it doesn't really matter um, what, what axis actually. Uh, theta is basically the angle from where the coordinate is straight up to the z-axis. Right? And phi is the angle where you drop this down to the equatorial plane, then so drop that point down the equatorial plane, and now you've got a angle uh, in the equator, along the equator, and the angle with respect to the x-axis is what we call phi. So, <coughs> um, well, we started with a kind of just the abstract quantum mechanical parametrization. Um, now you, you guys asked me why do we call it 
why do we have these theta on twos and stuff like that? You know? um, because we started off with just saying that these were complex numbers, and then um, um, complex numbers have like two parameters each, right? So in principle, you can have uh, two complex, like two parameters here, like the R and like the modulus and then the argument, also two complex numbers. So in principle, there's four complex numbers, but then a quantum state is normalized, so it goes down to three. <coughs> and then the global phase doesn't matter, which is why basically this one doesn't have a, uh, which is why this one doesn't have a complex number. This is a real number because basically we just say, okay, global phase doesn't matter, never, never see it. So now we're down to two. So we've got two parameters, theta and phi, and I mean, yeah, so if you were going on that logic, it wouldn't really matter, like you wouldn't really think of putting in this theta on two. But if you put in the theta on two, uh, you get this very nice visual sort of representation of all the possible states that you can have for a qubit. So if you have uh, basically, if you look at the unit sphere, and then you look at every possible, um, you know, coordinate, theta and phi coordinate, then that actually is like all the possible states that you can have for a qubit. Okay. Um, now, for higher dimensional systems, there's more variables, and actually you can't really visualize it like this anymore because it's well, it's too, too the, the dimensionality is too high, but um, but this is what's called the so-called block sphere, um, and uh, uh, it's you know basically these expectation values kind of give you the coordinates like these um, well the x y z coordinates because of course these things relate your polar coordinates to your Cartesian coordinates right so actually. It's, you can say that this is why it's called x, y, z, because when you take the expectation values, they reduce to the Cartesian coordinates, but the actual sort of parameterization will be in terms of these uh, polar angles. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, four goes to three because of normalization. So these two numbers, the modular squared, have to be one. Right? So that four becomes three, and global phase knocks out another one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. All right, we'll leave it there. Thursday.